This presentation covers the topic of as low as reasonably practicable, or a LARP. We're going to look at it from an overview of the entire process, which I accept will be coloured from a UK legislative perspective viewpoint, but I hope I'll be able to show you that the, the basic principles apply, no matter where the risks are being managed. Starting from the basics, we've seen this diagram in a number of places already. However, it does contain the most fundamental principles of all risk management, and these should be considered to apply irrespective of location, industry, type of risk, e.g. safety, environment, reputation, project, etc., or timing within a project schedule. For us to be able to even start to say that we're managing our risks, it is critical that we understand what we're dealing with. What could affect the things, people, plant, project, business, etc., that we care about or are responsible for, where they come from, how they might manifest themselves, and what the possible loss of control scenarios are, and what controls we have, both preventative and mitigative, in place to manage them. These four things allow us to characterize the risk and to understand it, such that we're able to then make an informed decision about how well we are managing that risk, and also whether it is, to our organization, an acceptable risk. In this context, I'm using acceptable to mean something that represents a tolerable risk level, a risk that we wish to retain within the organization and something that we believe that we can comfortably manage. And if we can say yes to all of this, then the next question has to be, is this the best we can do? Now, any risk assessment of whatever type should be looked on not only as an opportunity to gain understanding, but also as an opportunity for improvement. Anything else could be argued to be just so much box ticking. This applies to, say, a review of a multi-billion dollar petrochemical project as much as it does to a job safety analysis before undertaking a task in a hospital. For both cases, whether we are the risk owner or the person exposed to the risk, we want to be able to say we fully understand what we're getting into, that we've looked to see if additional risk controls can be put in place, and that anything that is practicable is there. In this sense, proving that risks are a LARP shouldn't be something we regard as a separate exercise, but it's really just an intrinsic part of performing any risk assessment. Accepting a risk may thus be viewed as a, a series of hurdles to be crossed or levels to be achieved. First of these, which has to be viewed as black and white, i.e. a non-negotiable question, is have we done the basics? Have we complied with the requirements of whatever legislation might be applicable to the activity? A failure to deploy a basic measure would seriously undermine any alarm judgment, and in the case of a legislative measure, it would invalidate it. Now, for example, the UK's control of asbestos regulations require mandatory training for anyone liable to be exposed to asbestos fibres whilst at work. Legislative prescribed requirements are mandatory, irrespective of sacrifice considerations, and cannot be argued against on grounds of costs. It also follows that the risk must lie on a level, whether qualitatively or quantitatively assessed, that is at least regarded as tolerable. Different industries and organisations will define tolerable in different ways, but it may be, say, less than a one in a thousand chance of a fatality, or that the risk must lie outside of the high risk zone on a risk matrix. The next hurdle that we would then have to cross could be referred to in shorthand as, I suppose, industry standards. Do we have the controls in place that either our own company standards have mandated or that are regarded as good practice within our industry? And the issue of what is regarded as good practice is discussed elsewhere within this course, but if there's a common set of standards in place, e.g. such as might be set by an industry guidance body or international standards, then at the very least we should be seriously questioning ourselves as to why we do not have them in place for our operation. What would our defence be in a court of law as to why these standards, controls, measures, etc. were not in place for us? That said, however, no set of such standards could ever hope to cover all possible situations, and so there will undoubtedly be times where we might need to deviate. And as such, this could be viewed as nearly black and white or dark grey. We can deviate, but we'd better have a very good reason for doing so. And we should also make sure that the justification for any such deviation is recorded. Once we've got across these two hurdles, at best, all we can really say is we're doing the basics. We're doing pretty much what everyone else is doing. Is this really the best we can do? Is this really what we aspire to as a company? There should always be the questions of, could I do anything more? Does it make sense to do so? 
there's a commonly used saying that if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. Yes, we may have successfully completed this task many times in the past, but it, are you absolutely certain that it wasn't down to your lucky rabbit's foot? If we don't ask the question, is there anything more we can do, we're never going to be able to say that our risk is truly a LARP. And the phrasing that's commonly used around this is, what more could I do? Why haven't I done it? Now, we're generally quite comfortable with the idea that the type, methods, etc. of risk assessment should be proportional to the level of risk. Given what I've said earlier about assessing whether we are a LARP, should not be viewed as something separate to the overall risk assessment, then should it not also follow that in answering the question, does it make sense to do so, i.e. is it practicable, the same basic principles should also apply. That the effort, detail, etc. that we put into deciding what more we can do and should do to further reduce risk should also be proportional. Now, this diagram is adapted from a UK Health and Safety Executive Guidance Note on Risk Assessment for the offshore industries. But the same basic approach can be seen across many industry guidance notes is, and is embedded within most companies' approaches toward risk management, albeit not necessarily stated as explicitly. We don't seek the same level of understanding, require the same depth of assessment for simple, well-understood, low-risk tasks, same manual handling, as we would for major risks, release of product with off-site effects. As the situation becomes more complex, less certain, and as the risks increase, so the need for greater depth of analysis for greater understanding increases. So for any additional risk reduction measures we could identify in deciding whether or not they could be implemented, and it is our decision for there are risks and our controls, then as a general rule we should be starting simple, using our knowledge, our experience to decide if it is practical, i.e. should it be adopted, before adding greater analysis detail to help that decision. The basic process then becomes, am I comfortable? I understand this. Do I understand the uncertainties to decide if this is a decision we can hang our hats on? And if the answer is no, then we add more detail to the assessment. Now, this set of general principles was expanded upon in the guidance document produced by the United Kingdom Offshore Operators Association, UCOA, entitled A Framework for Risk-Related Decision Support. Now this is discussed in far more detail in the video presentation accompanying the introduction to risk management model, so we're not covered again here. So in deciding whether or not a potential risk reduction measure is practicable, we're looking at understanding what would be the benefit, i.e. in reducing the frequency of an event or its consequences, and also what could be the sacrifice involved in implementing that measure. The sacrifice may include many things, such as the cost of putting in place an extra guard, an extra item, but may also include less tangible items, such as increased time to perform a job or reduce productivity from a process. This leads to a balancing act between sacrifices and benefits. Remembering, however, that we should always be erring on the side of implementation, or, if you like, the benefits will weigh heavier than the sacrifices. As discussed above, we've three general approaches towards risk assessment, qualitative, semi-quantitative, and quantitative. And the same applies to deciding whether or not implementing the changes is practicable. The simplest would be a qualitative judgment based on our experience and knowledge to make a decision. For example, two workers go out to replace a bulb in a lamppost. When they get there, they found the grind looks unstable. So rather than just put the ladder down, they decide to get a board and place this on the ground to provide a firm, stable base. It's unlikely they'd ever really call this a risk assessment, let alone an LARP assessment, but they've understood and evaluated the scenario, identified an additional risk control, and decided to implement it. And this is how, really, we ensure that a large part of, if you like, our day-to-day -day risks are managed, making sure that people have got the necessary training and knowledge for their duties and putting in place an attitude that asks people to question the safety of their tasks and the environment and to look for improvements. There will, however, always be cases where greater planning and discussion may be needed. For example, if we were planning a confined space entry or deferring maintenance on critical equipment. For these types of decisions, we'd expect a detailed engineering review to be performed, or for job safety analysis permit to works to be completed, allowing for a thorough review and understanding of the issues. In the same way, evaluating the practicability, i.e. The, the sacrifices, the benefits of any risk reduction measures, may also benefit from a more detailed approach. Use of a, a simple matrix can allow for more informed discussion 
and to bring structure and consistency to a decision-making process as made for the relative sacrifices and benefits as they're evaluated. Examples may be in deciding whether to implement additional PPE for a rarely performed task or in reviewing the acceptability of existing controls for plant that's to be operated for some years beyond its design life. Taking the early example of our two people changing a light bulb, potential additional risk reduction measures, we could use a cherry picker, we could use scaffolding, both of which we could consider to be, say, medium sacrifice. But given the level of existing control we already have, a stable platform, low exposure, two people present, the level of additional risk reduction may not necessarily be that great. So unless it was a, a high risk situation, I'd say next to a busy road, it would probably not be practicable to implement these measures. For significant or complex situations and risks, then we have cost benefit analysis available to us. This can be used to aid our decision making process by providing a, a numerical assessment of the costs for example, purchase cost, increased maintenance hours, installation downtime, etc., against the benefits. Typically, we do this by assigning a monetary value to the harm, such as loss of life, injuries that we've avoided, and using an appropriate numerical disproportion factor, the weighting factor on the seesaw. This might be applicable for major risks, for risks where the effects go off site, or risks where there's no or little relevant good practice in place to guide us. It's important to remember, though, that cost-benefit analysis should be used as an aid to our decision-making process, to bring clarity to certain areas, not to replace our knowledge and judgment. As the UK's HSE have clearly stated, a cost-benefit analysis cannot justify what is evidently poor engineering. In summary, then, the important thing to remember is that to manage our risks to alarm, we have to make sure we understand what we're getting into, what our hazards are, what we currently have, our existing controls, that we've looked for potential improvements and have evaluated to a degree commensurate with the level of risk whether or not they're practicable. So this final diagram presents a summary of the whole process using a bow tie as an example tool to assist us. So first question, what are our risks? What are the ones we're most concerned about? Either from a, a risk level and an uncertainty viewpoint. What are the controls that we currently have in place to manage these risks? How are they enforced? Are there enough? Do they comply with legislative requirements and meet good practice? Do they reduce the risks to a tolerable level? At this point we can also ask how much can we rely on them? The better we can identify our weak barriers, the better we can target looking for potential improvements. Why are we tolerating a weak barrier? Does it give us a false sense of security? This also then allows us with our clear understanding of what we're actually relying on rather than what we might like to believe that we have to ask the key question of could I do anything more? And then for potential improvements either in terms of improving our existing controls or adding new ones then the question of does it make sense? Is it reasonably practicable to do so? How much bang will I get for my buck? For this additional risk reduction measure, how much further will it reduce risk over what we already have in place? And what will the sacrifice be? For example, in time, trouble, cost, difficulty in implementing it. What is our decision at this point? And once we've made that decision, our risks don't go down until we've actually put those controls in place. Documenting the decision process has an obvious covering ourselves benefit in case something should ever go wrong in the future, but more importantly, also allows for others to understand the rationale behind implementing or rejecting a measure. It would also allow for us in the future, should our chosen additional measures not be as effective as we would have liked, to come back to the decision-making process to re-evaluate other measures again. I hope that this has given you an overview of the ideas and approaches to ALARP and shown to you that the basic principles of ALARP apply at all levels of, of risk management.